Very different technology to Sanger. But there are some similarities, as you'll see. And I'm, I'm going to start off halfway through with this, which might seem a bit odd, um, but I think you'll see why I'm explaining it this way. So what I'm going to do is to describe how illuminative sequencing works once you've got the DNA that you want in the place that you want it, uh, and then I'm going to tell you how you get the DNA that you want in the place that you want it. And th there is a reason why I'm doing it that way around. I think it, it'll make it a bit easier to understand. Because what I want you to get, oops, first of all, something wrong with that projector. What I want you to understand, first of all, is, is the basic idea, like I did with the Sanger sequencing. So, um, in Illumina sequencing, as I said, it works by making the reaction massively parallel, so having millions and millions of sequencing reactions happening at the same time. We're just going to look at one sequencing reaction. So I'm, I'll talk about the parallel nature of this later on. Uh, and here's how it works. Let's imagine this is your um, piece of DNA that you want to sequence. Obviously, you don't know what the sequence is um, at this stage. And um, as you can see, this sequence is tethered to a surface. So it's covalently bound to a fixed surface. So this is um, one of the first differences with Sanger sequencing. Sanger sequencing takes place in free solution, in aqueous solution. With Illumina sequencing, your sequences are tethered to a fixed template, a fixed surface. And you'll see the reason why that's important later on. Uh, so here's our situation. We have our strand of DNA. It's a single strand tethered to a surface. And to that, we anneal uh, a primer. I've just drawn a very short primer there. Uh, which is complementary to the sequence. Now, what we're going to do to that is we're going to add uh, DNA polymerase and four uh, DNA precursors, exactly as you would with any other DNA sequencing reaction. <clears throat> but there are two important differences here. First of all, um, all of these are blocked. So with the Sanger reaction, you've got part of one of the pools of, of nucleotides is blocked. It's the dideoxy. With Illumina sequencing, they're all blocked. Uh, the second difference, well, actually, it's not such a difference. Um, again, each one of these is conjugated with a different fluorophore. So each one of these will fluoresce with a different wavelength. So to this um, isolated strand of DNA with a primer anneal, you add these four nucleotide precursors, but they cannot be extended. So what will happen um, when the DNA polymerase is present is that it's going to incorporate just one base, and it's going to stop at that point. Can't go any further. The nature of the blockage is different. It's not the same chemistry as in Sanger. You don't need to know what that is. Um, it's, it's actually slightly complicated, um, and there's different chemistries that are used with different Illumina setups, so um, I'm not going to go into the details of that. The point is that what you've now got is a primer which has been extended by one base only, and that one base is also <coughs> complementary to the next base in the DNA sequence. So in this case, because there was a C there, what's happened is it's incorporated a G. What we can now do is we can then illuminate that surface with a laser, and we can record the wavelength of the fluorescent light that's emitted. So depending on which base had been incorporated, we'd get a different wavelength of light. In this case, kind of a sort of mustardy green color. Okay, so we can scan this surface with a laser light, get a flash of light corresponding to the presence of that G, and that tells us that we've incorporated a single G at that position. In the next step, we then carry out a chemical reaction that removes the block on that G. Okay, so we, we're cleaving the fluorophore, which blocks the extension of the G. So that G is no longer fluorescent, and it's now got a free 3 prime hydroxide, so it can now be used for the next stage in DNA synthesis. Okay, so incorporate the base, measure the fluorescence, cleave off the fluorophore, and that unblocks the base, so we can now put in the next base. Now we go back to the original reaction. We add all four um, uh, DNTPs and DNA polymerase, uh, all of them, remember, are blocked again. So now we put in the next base, which happens to be an A in this case, because T is next on the complementary strand. And again, we can only put one base in 
because again, this base is chemically blocked. Okay, so you've got a sequence of reactions taking place. You're adding DNA polymerase with nucleotides, you're measuring the fluorescence, you're cleaving off the block, then you're adding DNA polymerase with nucleotides again. And each step, you're putting these things in, washing them off, putting the next thing in, washing it off. So now when you measure um, the fluorescence, you're going to get red because there's an A incorporated there, so you know the next base on the sequence is an A. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Same reaction again, cleave off the fluorophore, that stops the A from fluorescing, and it means that you can now extend that A because you've removed the block. Same thing again. Next thing that will be incorporated will be a T because the next base is an A. Again, measure the fluorescence, cleave off the block, Again, add the DNA polymerase. So you have this sequence of reactions taking place. Each time you do a reaction, you add one base. You see what that base is by measuring its fluorescence. Then you cleave off the fluorophore, add another base, measure the fluorescence, cleave off the fluorophore, and so on. So as you um, keep on extending that strand, for each base, you're going to get a different fluorescent signal depending on what the complementary base is. And by reading those sequences in sequence, you can then tell what the sequence is. Now you can see the reason why this has to be tethered, because you've got to read that at the same position every time. If this was wandering around in free solution, and there were loads of other random nucleotides in there as well, you'd just get a mixture of different wavelengths of light. If you measure it at one position, and you don't allow it to move from that position, by seeing what happens at fluorescence at that position, you are sequencing the DNA strand at that point on, on, on the solid support. Okay, so there's a lot of um, novel stuff had to be developed in order to make this possible. You had to find a way of anchoring um, this, you had to find the chemistry for doing this, and obviously um, the measurement of the fluorescence and the, the cleavage and so forth, those are all um, separate reactions taking place. It's quite a complicated process. And actually, it's a lot more complicated than this. It has to be more complicated, because there's a lot of questions I haven't answered. Um, the first thing is, how do you get your, your signal to be high enough? One molecule fluorescing is not going to be bright enough. Actually, you can look at single molecules fluorescing, but it, it's a very um, tricky and, and sophisticated process. What you want is a whole load of DNA strands of the same sequence at the same position, so all of them fluoresce with the same color at the same time. How do you do that? What, what's the method that is going to enable you to do that? Um, I very glibly put on a primer at the start of the sequence, but by definition in this process, we're starting off with random unknown sequence. So how do we synthesize a primer complementary to that sequence if it's just random sequence? Uh, how do you attach the DNA to the support? How, how do you get DNA to fix to a support like that? And, and how this, this, if you can solve all these problems... This will generate sequence for one little tiny strand of DNA. How do you use this method to get very large amounts of sequence? So, does everyone understand the basic principle before I go into answering these questions? You get this idea about adding one base at a time, measuring which base has gone on, that gives you the sequence. Then we'll answer all these questions, and you'll see hopefully how this can be turned into a highly parallel set of reactions. Now, um, if you want to find out more about Illumina sequencing, uh, there's loads of actually quite good videos on YouTube, um, and there's some very good websites about it. Obviously, the company itself has produced quite a lot, but there's lots of other ones as well. Um, and you'll find, if you do that, that there's actually quite a few variations on the basic method. So what I'm giving you is a very stripped-down version, because I want you to understand the basic concept. Um, but there's lots of variations to this that enable you to um, measure different things. Yeah, you've got a question. In the exam, if you have a question on Illumina, do you have to know some of those variations? Um, the course is open-ended, so the more that you know, the better. Okay? If, if you want to read up about it, that's great. If a question came up about it and you could show that you'd done that reading, that would be very good. So um, we'll be talking a lot about DNA sequence analysis and... and um, Many of you, or some of you at least, will probably do projects that involve this technique, so it would be good to learn the refinements. Um, but don't panic too much if you, you know, discover there's ten different versions and you, you don't quite understand them all, because some of them are uh, pretty complicated. What I'm giving you is a very stripped-down version, keeping it as simple as possible. <laughs>
Um, so this is one of the ways in which um, Illumina sequencing works. There are, there are others um, that you can study uh, in your own time. So let's say we want to sequence um, a genome. We start off by preparing total DNA from that organism, and then we fragment it randomly by sonication. So this is going back to exactly the same process that I talked about with the Sanger sequencing. You're breaking your genome DNA into completely random bits of DNA. Um, generally speaking, for Illumina, uh, you want things which are around about 200, 300 base pairs long, and you can adjust the length of sonication to give you the right size fragment. Having done that, uh, and there are different methods as well, actually. Sonication isn't the only method. There's other ones, too. Having got your random pieces of DNA, you then attach a particular oligonucleotide at each end, and each one has a different sequence. Um, these are primers that you uh, buy from Illumina, and I won't go through the details of how the attachment is done. Um, just take it from me that it, it's, a, it's a fairly standard method. So what you've now got is, is literally hundreds of millions of bits of random DNA, all from the same genome, all with one of two primers at the two ends. Okay, so I'm not going to show the sequences. We'll call one the blue primer and one the green primer, but that is a particular sequence of DNA. Uh, now, this is the, the, what I think is the first really clever step. Illumina, who are the company that do this, provide um, what's called a flow cell. And a flow cell, again, is about the size of a microscope slide. It's really quite small. Um, and on that microscope slide are attached uh, millions of copies of DNA which are complementary to the primer sequences. So these have been covalently linked to um, uh, essentially the plastic surface. And what that means is that if you now add your sonicated library to that flow cell, it will hybridize to these primers. These will form complementary base pairs, and so your random fragments of DNA will stick to that flow cell. Okay, they're not covalently linked. They're just linked by hydrogen bonds where these primers have annealed. Um, but you'll now have dotted around that flow cell all your different bits of DNA at different positions. Of course, we'd like these to be covalently attached, and that's quite easy to do because those bits of DNA which are attached are templates. And the primer which is fixed to the plate is a primer. So we can use those primers to synthesize a complementary copy of DNA to the strand that you attach to the plate. Okay, so you've attached your strand initially just by base pairing of the primer sequence. That primer is now used to synthesize another strand of DNA. So you add DNA polymerase and the um, precursors, not labeled, just um, straightforward chemical precursors, and you'll then get the complementary strand sequenced, uh, uh, synthesized. And because, of course, these primers were attached to the plate, that whole strand is now covalently attached to the plate. It's fixed in position. And the place where it's fixed um, corresponds to where the original primer was. And these are just randomly attached to the plate. So we can now get rid of the original strand. You can just denature that, wash it off. And so what you've now got is a series of strands complementary to your original strand, covalently linked to the flow cell. Okay, so they're physically attached now to the flow cell. Now, this is the one, uh, the step that always kind of blows my mind a bit. And why anyone thought about this in the first place, I really don't know. Um, the next step is a PCR step called bridge amplification. And remarkably, it does work. And the aim of bridge amplification is to build up multiple copies of the same sequence at the same position. So you start off with a single molecule. Now, remember, and I'm using, using, using similar sort of color coding here, Go back to that. Here's the different strands. You've got both primers fixed to the flow cell, to the, to the plate. So the other primers which are nearby will hybridize to this primer here. And what happens is, this is DNA is a very flexible molecule, extremely bendy. Um, and this thing will be waving around in free solution. And if this finds a primer which is complementary to it, it'll anneal to it. So you'll then have that molecule will actually form a bridge between those two primers um, to give you a structure rather like this. So this is very diagrammatic, but essentially what you've got is this molecule here 
that primer that, remember, you put on the other end of the molecule will hybridize to that primer and form this structure. And wouldn't you know it, that is also a template for DNA polymerase because you've now got a single strand, which is this, this bit, and you've got a primer. So you can now prime another DNA sequence reaction from that primer there, which is going to give you the complementary strand. So what you've now got is two strands, both covalently attached to the plate, very close together. So they can't be further away than the length of that DNA molecule, which is, as I said, maybe 200 bases long. So these are, these are complementary to each other. And you do this process multiple times. So what's going to happen is these two can also then bridge amplify. And then all the copies that they make can amplify again. And so essentially what you're doing is a PCR reaction, but you're doing it in situ. You're doing it just at the position that that original strand annealed. And the net effect of that is you're going to finish up with clusters of molecules which are um, identical in sequence but will represent both strands, both complementary strands. And I've not drawn this terribly well. These will be physically close together and separated from clusters of other molecules because the size of this cluster is essentially defined by how far the DNA molecule can move. So what you're building up on the flow cell is um, hundreds of thousands of copies of identical strands of DNA at particular positions. I'm astonished that this works. Okay? You know, and the first person said, I know, let's try and see if DNA molecules are bendy enough that they can do this. Um, you know, it's kind of a crazy idea, but it, it does work, um, and it's a very important part of Illumina sequencing. Now, of course, these all end with the same oligonucleotide primer, or you know, one of the two primers. And remember the question that one of the questions I asked you beforehand was, how do you make a primer which is complementary to your unknown DNA? The answer is you don't need to, because you've already attached a sequence to the end of your unknown DNA, and you know what that sequence is. You've defined it. And that means that if you make a primer which is um, complementary to that, it's going to anneal to half of the strands in that cluster. So you don't have to worry about the randomness of the sequence because the fixed part of the sequence is determined by the primer that you put on in the original reaction all the way back, you go back to this step here. You know what these sequences are, and so you can design primers which are complementary to those sequences. Okay, so let's go through that again. Annealing using the primer sequence. A copying step, which then means that it's um, covalently linked to the uh, flow cell. Bridge amplification, that gives you clusters of fragments of identical sequence at the same position. And then sequencing of those using the method that I showed you, where you do it base by base, using a primer which is complementary to the oligonucleotide that you put on that strand. Now, this is where the parallel part comes from. If you were just sequencing one of these clusters, it would be a really slow process. But on a flow cell, you might have 100 million clusters. And those clusters are defined by the positions of the primers that are on the flow cell when you buy it, actually. These flow cells are not cheap, as you can imagine. Um, but once you've got those primers on the flow cell, you're going to build clusters at that sort of density. So when you do your sequencing reaction, rather than sequencing one cluster, Every single cluster on that plate is generating sequence information. Um, what does that look like? It looks something like this. So this is a snapshot um, of an Illumina flow cell at one particular point in the sequencing reaction. Um, in this case, there are around about 40 million clusters on the flow cell, but um, this is actually from a few years ago. You can get higher density now. So each of these spots represents an amplified cluster of a given fragment. So what you can see is that every spot that's green has incorporated a G. Every spot that's red has incorporated an A, and, and so on. So what you know is, for that cluster, at that point, there's a G residue there. Now, if you were to do, um, go through the whole reaction, so cleave off, you know, record this data, cleave off the fluorophores, do another round of reaction, these colors would all change. So that one might go red, that one might stay yellow, that one might go blue, that one might go green. 
depending on what the sequence is. But what you've got to imagine is you're looking, at, you know, let's pretend you're the computer, okay, you're the, you're the photomultiplier. You're looking at, at 400 million spots, 40 million spots in this case, and you're recording the colour of each of those spots at each point in the reaction. And each of those colour changes represents a base in the sequence of the DNA at that position. So you can see, because you've got so many of these simultaneously, you're gathering 40 million pieces of sequence information as opposed to 96. So that's half a million times, no, five million times more, no, half a million times more information than you'd get um, from a Sanger sequencing reaction. So the, the power of Illumina is that you can sequence um, tens or hundreds of millions of random bits of sequence at the same time in the same reaction. Um, and again, you can see here why they have to be anchored to the plate in a particular position. If they were moving around, it wouldn't work. They've got to be fixed in position. And that position has got to be recordable because the, um, the software, hardware and the software recording that information needs to know at that point I've got this particular sequence and at this point next to it I've got another sequence. Um, this will give you from a given Illumina sequencing run tens of millions or hundreds of millions of random sequence reads. So this is your thousand volumes of Shakespeare ripped up into pieces. DJ. So, just quickly, you know when you said you've got the, the two different primers, do you run two different primers uh, when you're doing the sequencing? No, you do a, sequ you do a single primer, because okay. otherwise any spot might fluoresce in two different colours at the yeah. same time, so which would complicate. You give away 50% of it. And, and some of the methods actually detach the complementary strand as well, so sometimes you're just sequencing the one, the one strand. Okay, so the output of this is a huge sequencing file um, with, with many, many, many millions of bases in. This is literally equivalent to a thousand volumes of Shakespeare ripped up into 200, 200 um, letter-long chunks. Uh, that's then got to be put back together into a complete sequence, and this is where the computational power comes in. It is a very big computational problem indeed. Yeah? Um, it, it's the point is what you're looking for for any one piece of any one stretch of DNA you're looking within the other 39,999,901 sequences for one that overlaps with that and that's true for every single piece so it's a 40 million times 40 million matrix which is 160 trillion possible alignments that you can make so it's, it's a big problem it's computationally hard um, for a number of reasons, but partly it's just the sheer magnitude of the, of the issue. You're, you're, you're trying to find so many matches. There's other reasons that make it more complicated because um, Illumina is not a perfect system, so you will get misincorporation from time to time. So you've got to allow not quite perfect matches. And it's also an issue, which is that if the overlap is quite small, there are lots of places that overlap could occur. So I don't know if any of you do jigsaw puzzles, but, you know, the sky is always the worst part to do because every piece is blue. So it's a bit like that. So if you've got a five or six base pair overlap, within a large genome, any given five or six base pair sequence can occur thousands of times. So you might think there's an overlap there, but until you find another overlap that corresponds to both of those two, you're not so sure about it. Um, and generally speaking, with a typical Illumina reaction... Um, depending on, on the question that you're asking, you'll probably sequence each base between 30 and 60 times. So actually, you have, you talk about the depth of sequencing, which means how many times is each base represented in that sequence. So you have many, many copies of that particular base. This becomes very important if you're trying to spot, for example, rare mutations within a, a population. Um, or if you're doing... Um, what I talked about earlier on, where you're not sequencing one genome, but many genomes at the same time. So it, it is a big problem, but most of its bigness comes from the fact that there's much, much more data in there than there would be with the Sanger. The principle is basically the same. Thanks for the questions, guys. Do, do keep them coming. Um, so this is a table. It's a little bit out of date now. Um, it's from a few years ago, but the basic principle still applies. This is... 
um, comparing a bunch of different methods. So we've got Sanger over here, um, Illumina here, and uh, some other methods here, um, which have become a little bit redundant now, which also sequence bit by bit. Um, there's an interesting exception, which is this one here, which is um, called PacBio for short. And this is a very different technology, which enables you to sequence much longer molecules. So you can sequence um, millions of bases from a single molecule. And this is important, as we'll see uh, later on. They all have their drawbacks. Um, so PacBio and Illumina, uh, you need very expensive kit. PacBio especially is very expensive. Illumina is pretty expensive. Um, some of them are a little bit slow. Some of them are fairly fast. Uh, some of them, like Iron Torrent, um, if you run into stretches of repetitive DNA, that, that really struggle to cope with that. Uh, Illumina is good, but its accuracy is not as high as Sanger, so you get a higher um, miscalling of bases. Uh, and then there's the question of cost. So if you work out cost per base, you can see that on this comparison, Illumina um, at 5 to 15 cents per base, this is from an American publication, came in really cheap. And Sanger, by comparison, is over $2,000 a base. So there's a, you know, a massive cost saving doing it this way because of the highly parallel nature of the reactions. Not because the chemistry is cheaper, um, but because you're doing so many reactions at the same time. Now, this figure has come down quite a bit. That's a, an old um, publication. It's even cheaper than that now. Not because the chemistry has got cheaper, but because the machines have got even better at doing large numbers of clusters in a single experiment. Let me briefly say something about the PAC bio. So, um, the, the, the problem that I keep on alluding to, it goes back to your question, is this problem of reassembling all the data. It's, it's pretty bad with bacterial genomes, but it's handleable. It's a nightmare with things like the human genome, which is, contains so much repetitive DNA, because you, you find yourself in places where you don't know where you are relative to other places. Uh, and the only way around, there's different ways around this actually, but one way around this would be instead of only getting reads of two or three hundred bases, supposing you could sequence two million bases in a single reaction, then you'd be able to get through the repetitive DNA back into some unique DNA sequence. And this is what um, PacBio does. So PacBio can sequence uh, very, very long stretches of DNA with very high accuracy. Uh, so if you combine, so for example, it says 5,000 bases, maximum read length, 22,000 bases. So that's reading 22,000 bases of contiguous sequence from a single DNA molecule. Now, the most you'll get out of um, Illumina is about 250 bases. So there's orders of magnitude difference in these two methods. Uh, but PacBio is extremely expensive, and you don't get the high throughput that you get with Illumina. So ideally, if you're trying to sequence a genome, you'd use both methods. You'd use the PacBio to build up the long sequence reads, and then you'd map your Illumina sequence reads onto those PacBio sequence reads. Now, as I'll show you um, later on, there's a new method that now has made, essentially made PacBio um, redundant, which is much quicker, uh, cheaper and much quicker, and that's um, the so-called nanopore technology. We'll get onto that in a later lecture. Um, so this is what the kit looks like. This is, a, uh, again, slightly out of date now. Uh, this is a, a high seat 2000 from Illumina. Um, it would sit on a bench about this sort of size, so it's not the kind of thing you can carry around in your back pocket. Um, the flow cells are a lot smaller than this in real life. They are literally about the size of a microscope slide. Um, this one's got a pretty high cluster density uh, of, of primers, but actually um, the, the, the more modern techniques... Uh, from, uh, technology from Illumina has much higher density. And actually, the latest um, technology from Illumina is starting to not have random primers, but have the primers in an ordered array on the grid. So they're all exactly the same distance apart, and your clusters are all exactly the same distance apart. And that's where the technology is going. So this can pump out 64 gigabytes of sequence a day, um, and the more up-to-date versions can give you even more than that. So if you go to somewhere like BGI... Uh, you will see they don't run the old ABI sequences anymore. They run things like the high seeks. And again, you'll have, um, you can walk down a, a, a lab of these and you'll see dozens of these in line, each one of which is producing um, many, many millions of bases every day. Biggest problem here? Well, there are two big problems um, other than the computational ones I've referred to. One is data storage, because there are terabytes of data being produced by these things. To store that in a way that you can quickly search and analyze is actually a big problem. 
And the people who are helping um, the biologists here are the physicists, because they've been doing this for years with things like the big colliders, um, which generate massive amounts of data, all of which has to be stored somewhere. Um, the other problem is heat. Rather like going to the data centers that Google and Facebook and Amazon run, uh, these things produce a lot of waste heat. Uh, I knew a guy that was kitting out a whole building with these, and basically um, he rented 10 floors, five floors for the sequences, and five floors for the cooling water. So although each individual one doesn't pump out too much heat, when you've got 50 or 60 of these in a row, it gets pretty hot, and you've got to get rid of that heat somehow. Um, this is not an unusual problem. If you ever go online, look, look at the videos of going around the Google data centers. Um, they run power stations off the amount of waste heat they generate. So every time you do a Google search, you're helping give some person in Iceland or Scandinavia a bit of light in their home. Now, this is going up all the time. So every couple of years, um, Illumina come out with a, a, a model which makes all the other ones supposedly redundant. Uh, we still use the old MySeqs down here at the bottom, which are, are perfectly good for our purposes. But we have HiSeq 2500. I think there are now some HiSeq 4000s in the building as well. The big data centers will use uh, these enormous ones at the top that are very expensive but produce extremely high amounts of data. And on a cost basis, it actually means that the more money you spend on the kit, the cheaper your reads get per gigabyte of data. So if your sole aim is to churn out massive amounts of sequence data, it pays to invest in the, in the high-end kit. Okay, so... Um, this isn't a bioinformatics course. Uh, there is a bioinformatics master's that runs in parallel to this. If you, after doing this one, you want to do another master's to learn how to analyze all this sort of stuff, um, that's the kind of thing you need to do. But people are talking now very much in terms of uh, what they call giga science, because the limiting factor here is not the rate at which you can produce the data. The limiting factor is how far you can analyze and make sense of that data. And in much the same way as um, astronomers are still looking at data that was beamed back from Voyager 30 years ago, because it's taken that long to work through the data, um, data is accumulating in uh, very, very large uh, databases, online databases, which are often searchable uh, much more quickly than people can analyze it. And if you're trying to think about what you do with this sort of information, it needs significant computational expertise. So the biologists and the computer scientists have to get together and say, up to now we've been used to looking at one genome at a time or a few genes at a time. Now we've got 10,000 genomes. What extra information can we get from those and how do we get that kind of information? Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a different approach to uh, biological problems. And I, I'm sure some of you in your projects will, will get involved in projects which have come out of this where maybe some uh, high throughput data analysis has been done generated some biological hypotheses which you're now trying to test. Uh, and there are plenty of biologists now that spend all their time sitting in front of a computer terminal looking at sequence data and, and never actually get into the lab at all. It is a real change. It's a real difference in, in the way a lot of things are looked at. And don't run away thinking that all biology is done this way. A lot of biology is still done in what you might call the old-fashioned way. But this is growing. This is becoming very significant um, in uh, biological experimentation. Okay, that's great. We finished 20 minutes early, so um, you can absorb all that high data uh, idea. Go away and look, look at the videos on YouTube of Illumina sequencing um, and understand all about it. What I'll do next time is talk about um, nanopore sequencing, which is this other method, and then we'll look at how you can use DNA sequence information to look at RNA and uh, ribosomes as well. Okay, so I'll see you next week on that.